Perfect. And I am recording now. So uh, thank you everyone for coming to our third event this March. Uh, today, Alexandra is gonna give a talk on the phenomenology of love. Uh, a little bit about Alexandra. She is a Canadian graduate scholar working primarily on the phenomenology and epistemology of romantic love. Her research is informed by her interests both in existentialism and the philosophy of literature, especially poetry, and places a special emphasis on the theoretical importance of love's phenomenology. Uh, Alexandra, is there anything else that you would like to add to your intro? Not at all, that was perfect, thank you. All right, uh, if you want to go ahead and get started, uh, that would be great. Okay, perfect. So first of all, let me drop the handout into the chat just one more time to make sure that everyone's got it. Um, so I don't propose to share screen and have the handout up. Um, I just find that to be, um, that's too much of a good thing. You put the handout in the chat, you put the handout up, so anyway. Um, you'll just be looking at me uh, if you'll have the handout up beside, that would be excellent. Okay, so that said, um, thank you so much for coming to my talk. Um, before I uh, begin, two things. First of all, I would like to thank the Association of Philosophy Students for their invitation to speak today, um, as well as all of you for attending. And second, I would like to acknowledge the land that the University of Toronto operates on. So I wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island. And I am grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. That said, let's begin. So this talk is titled The Forgotten Phenomenology of Love. Why forgotten? Well, in it um, today, I'm going to argue that while what love is like is an indisputable part of love, the phenomenology of love has received surprisingly little attention in the field. Um, instead, we philosophers of love have focused on things like love's potential rationality or its particularity and how it functions within the context of a loving relationship. Love and its phenomenology shouldn't be thought of as separable, however. Any successful theory of love, I think, ought to be able to explain why love feels the way it does. So to this end, I propose we start using the phenomenology of love as a test of the explanatory power of our current best views of love. As they are, can they account for this forgotten feature? So as the first application of this proposed procedure, um, I'd like us to consider today a spectrum of views on love that I'll be calling relationship-directed attitude views. Very briefly, relationists about love attitudes claim that loving someone in particular necessarily involves having a specific attitude toward my relationship with them. However, I'm gonna argue that the phenomenology of love can't be successfully explained in terms of any relationship-directed attitude. This is a significant problem. Um, if no relationship directed attitude can explain why love feels the way it does, well then we've got serious reason to doubt that these attitudes are the right mental states to identify with love. Now note that to avoid any confounding variables, um, today I'll be restricting my focus to just one species of love romantic love. Uh, the views I'm considering, however, take themselves to be giving a unified account 
However, if I can show that there's even one aspect of the phenomenology that's not captured by these views, we've got that serious reason to doubt that they're the correct mental states. So let's talk about the phenomenology. What is the phenomenology of romantic love? So imagine if you will, that you're in the kitchen and that your beloved is pouring a glass of wine at the dinner table. So imagine that there's soft music playing, but that you don't really hear it. Instead, there is only their gentle sway, their hands cupping each glass tenderly in turn. And as you watch, there is only them and you are transfixed. There they are in your kitchen, somehow yours to love. And you know you love them precisely because they grip you in this way. This is one way that romantic love feels. For a moment, with our beloved at the center and forefront of our focus, everything else melts away. So I like to call this experience arrested attention. And it's this experience that I'll be describing in the various cases that follow. Of course, however, uh, this may only be one way that romantic love feels. So Monique Wonderly, for instance, thinks that romantic love, particularly reciprocal romantic love, is often best characterized as an attachment to our beloved. Attachment being something like a felt need. So it says Wonderly, um, attachment in this context is an attitude toward our beloved marked primarily by a felt need for our beloved in order to maintain our sense of security. So this feeling of needing may very well be another part of romantic love's phenomenology. Uh, other possibilities include a more passive feeling of security, a background feeling of warmth, or an ineffable feeling of connectedness. Tom Herka, in his Love and Reasons, The Many Relationships, argues for what he calls a syndrome view, under which romantic love is the coincidence, the co-occurring of any number of symptoms, um, things like physical attraction, uh, the desire for a relationship, importantly, um, concern for the other's well-being, et cetera. It may very well be the same with romantic love's phenomenology. It may at specific times or for certain people feel like either arrested attention or need or both these things or something else entirely. Um, I say, let all flowers bloom. I invite you to substitute a fitting phenomenological description wherever my arrested attention doesn't seem apt. And I encourage the philosopher of love among us to provide alternative phenomenologies. Regardless, um, it's enough for my purposes here to show that one part of love's phenomenology is dissociable from relationship-directed attitudes. Because as long as even that much is true, these views fail to explain why love feels the way it does and thus capture all that is essential about love. Now, let's talk about relationship-directed attitudes. We'll focus on the, uh, what I call strong version of the view, which claims that a relationship-directed attitude, again, just an attitude toward a relationship, is both necessary and sufficient for love. I'll then proceed to some weaker versions of the view, which don't make the same sufficiency claim. 
Now let's talk about relationship directed attitude views. Relationists about love attitudes claim that loving someone in particular involves having a specific attitude toward my relationship with them. So what kinds of attitudes could be something like valuing, desiring, caring about. What's important is that the object is the relationship. So I value the relationship. I desire that it should continue, etc. Today we'll be considering uh, three views in particular. They are Kolodny's, Nozick's, and Herka's. So what are these views? Well, first of all, we've got Kolodny. Kolodny thinks that love is the final valuing of a relationship, where a relationship is best understood as something like shared history and the person with whom we're in the relationship as the person with whom we're in the relationship. So what's important is that love is the final valuing of a relationship first and foremost. So what is the relevant relationship directed attitude in this case? It's valuing. We value our relationship with our beloved. We value our shared history. For this view, what's important to note is that the relationship directed attitude, i.e. valuing, is both necessary and sufficient for romantic love. Second, we've got Nozick. Nozick famously thinks that love is the desire to form a we, um, a metaphysical union. Here, the relevant relationship directed attitude is a desire. I desire to form this we with a particular person. What's important to note in this case is that the relationship directed attitude i.e. desiring, is necessary, but not sufficient. The third is Herka's view. Again, very briefly, Herka says that love is a syndrome of symptoms. What does this mean? Well, it's something like a cold. A cold often comes with a headache, a runny nose, sinus congestion, et cetera. But it doesn't always come with any one of these particular symptoms. In this way, a cold is a kind of syndrome. Perka thinks that romantic love is the same. In this case, the relevant relationship directed attitudes involved are many. It may be desiring a relationship, desiring the relationship continue, it might be valuing the relationship, caring about it, et cetera. What's interesting about this kind of view is that the relationship directed attitudes are neither necessary nor sufficient. However, they are typical. And Herka will argue that uh, love that doesn't have any number of these attitudes is an impoverished kind of love. So in a way, they aren't necessary, but they are highly recommended. So here's a standard case of romantic love according to these views. So any relationship directed attitude will fit but I'm going to be explaining the case in terms of Kalani's valuing. So for the next couple of cases, valuing is going to be our example relationship directed attitude. So here's the standard case. Long-term partners, Sam and Shireen, live together with their young son in Boston. On the eve of their 12th anniversary, Sam takes time to reflect on the many wonderful years she and Shireen have shared thus far. As she does, 
She watches Shireen laugh with their son across the dinner table and an unconscious smile curves the corners of her mouth. Sam is captivated. Watching Shireen, she thinks about how grateful she is to be in such a caring relationship and how grateful she is that this relationship is with Shireen of all people. So it seems like relationists about love attitudes should say about the above case that the phenomenology is a product of the relevant relationship directed attitude. In this case, Sam both values the relationship and experiences uh, the characteristic phenomenology. But let's consider a case in which the expected relationship directed attitude is present, but the phenomenology of love is not. So look now to standard sense phenomenology. Again, we've got long-term partners, Sam and Shireen on the eve of their 12th anniversary. Sam is thinking about how grateful she is to be in such a caring relationship and how grateful she is that this relationship is with Shireen. As she does, she watches Shireen laugh with their son across the dinner table. She's very glad that Shireen is happy and feels the same sort of satisfaction she does whenever she learns that something good has happened to someone deserving. Earlier that morning, for instance, she read in a news brief that a lonely little girl looking for pen pals had suddenly received hundreds of letters in the mail. Sam feels now like she felt then. A sympathetic feeling best captured by the words, good for her. This is how Sam feels whenever she is around a happy Shireen. When Shireen is sad, Sam feels the opposite. Oh, well, that's really too bad for her. So what's going on in this case? First of all, Sam is again grateful to be in such a caring relationship. She values the relationship. And what's more, even per Kolodny, she is grateful that she's in the relationship with Shireen. She's valuing Shireen in the right kind of way, namely as the person with whom she's in the valued relationship. However, the characteristic phenomenology of love is missing. What does this show? Well, that one can value one's relationship without feeling the characteristic phenomenology of love. So the relationship directed attitude does not explain the phenomenology. Let us now consider a case in which the experience of love is present, even in the absence of a relationship directed attitude. So I call this case standard sense attitude. Once more, we've got Sam and Shireen. We've got that phenomenology right? Sam watches Shireen laugh with their son across the dinner table and an unconscious smile curves the corner of her mouth. mouth. Sam, her heart warms and she feels she could look at Shireen forever. She feels truly smitten. Suppose, however, that Sam is also a staunch consequentialist. So suppose that as part of her consequentialism. She believes that her relationship to Shireen has no value outside of the good effects it produces. Similarly, she believes that her relationship to Shireen has no particular value, right? As a staunch consequentialist, Sam is committed to a general principle of impartiality. As such, she fully believes that a different relationship with someone else could be equally as good, so long as it produced similarly good effects. What's going on in this case? Well, Sam's got the characteristic phenomenology, 
there's that description of arrested attention. However, Sam simply doesn't value the relationship in the right kind of way. In fact, she thinks the relationship has no particular value. What does this show? Again, that the relationship directed attitude does not explain romantic love's characteristic phenomenology. Why? Well, in this case, one can feel love without appropriately valuing the relationship. Now, in the paper version of this talk, I run through about a half dozen more cases that these views can't account for, considering the various attitudes in turn. I won't run us through all of those cases here, but I'll instead simply say that what we have is a significant problem for all versions of the view. What were those views? Again, Kolodny said that love is the valuing of a relationship. Nozick, that love is the desire to form a union, to form a relationship, to form a we. And Herka thinks that love is a syndrome of symptoms. So Herka's view fares best, but is ultimately perhaps too permissive. I think we should prefer a view that explains why love feels the way it does, not just that it tends to feel a certain way. So Herka's is an example of a view which takes a unique stance toward the relevant relationship-directed attitude, claiming that it's neither necessary nor sufficient. Unlike Nozick's view, which attempts to distill love down to a fundamental desire, the desire for a relationship, Herkes takes a broader stance. Again, Herka thinks that romantic love just is a syndrome of symptoms. Importantly, this syndrome may very well involve the desire to form a relationship, but it need not, however. It also need not involve valuing a relationship. While Herka does hold the view that the fewer the symptoms, the more impoverished the love, we might take our example cases to definitively show that romantic love, at least its characteristic phenomenology, can exist without there being any such desire or valuation. Why is this? Well, once more, because love's phenomenology can exist independently of these attitudes. As a necessary feature of love, the independence of this phenomenology from any desire to form a relationship or valuing of a relationship shows that these cannot be a necessary part of what romantic love is. Unlike other relationship-directed attitude views, which are too reductive, however, Herka's may be too permissive. We might wonder whether such a view can succeed without taking a definitive stance on which of the associated symptoms are either necessary or sufficient for love. What is the result? Well, if no relationship-directed attitude can explain romantic love's phenomenology, we have serious reason to doubt that these attitudes are the right mental states to identify with love, generally speaking. These results should prompt philosophers of love to think not only about the plausibility of describing love in theoretical terms, but also to think more about the theoretical promise of love's phenomenology. So looking forward, a theory of love that manages this, therefore, is the goal. One that begins and ends with this forgotten but essential feature. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alexandra.
I'm just gonna 